All right, I'll go ahead and get us started. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, thank you all for coming. Would you please do a cell phone check? Make sure your cell phones are off. We videotape all of these, and as cool as your ringtones might be, uh, don't limit the video. <clears throat> and then I'll just say a little bit about what the Young Philosophers uh, lecture series is. It's a lecture series that's designed to have something for everybody. Uh, we, <clears throat> it's a competitive lecture series, so we had almost 50 submissions, and these were anonymously reviewed, so there were no shenanigans of inviting friends. Um, <clears throat> we picked the best papers, the philosophy department picked the best papers, and we invited four young philosophers, which doesn't necessarily mean young in age, it's young in terms of professional career, so it's time from PhD. If you have to be ABD or have received your PhD within, I think, six or seven years. I forget what our cutoff was, but they're all within the cutoff, whatever the cutoff is. Um, so it's time, having had the PhD, it was designed to give younger scholars a chance to get out and get their ideas out there, to get some exposure for their work. Uh, the colloquium circuit tends to be a bit of a buddy-buddy network, and this was designed to provide a colloquium that is based on things like merit rather than who you know. Uh, and we've been really pleased with the results over the last 78 years. We get uh, just fantastic philosophers. And then I said it's designed to be something for everyone. They come to campus and they give a research talk and an intro level talk. So there's really something for everyone. If you're a philosophy diehard, you definitely want to come tomorrow, Friday, out at Prindle. We'll be having the research talks out there. Today, all of the talks are intro level talks. So if you're just casually interested in philosophy, or if you're really interested in philosophy and you just want a nice introduction to a fun philosophical problem, <coughs> then this is for you. And in the spirit of there being something for everyone, even the people who can't make it to the talks can go to youngphilosophers.org and you can check out the videos of all previous young philosopher talks. So. I think this is a really wonderful series. I'm glad that it's here with us at DePaul. And now let me introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Nina Emery. Dr. Emery is an assistant professor at Brown University. Before that, she finished her PhD at MIT. Her research interests include philosophy of science and metaphysics. And the title of her intro talk today is Physics, Freedom, and Moral Responsibility. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Emery. All right, thanks so much. There's a handout that should be coming around that'll allow you to follow along. And anytime I use any technical terminology, which I won't be doing very much of, it'll be on the handout so you can refer back to it if you need to. So thanks to Andy and the Department of Philosophy here for inviting me. Thanks to the Prindle Institute and to DePaul University for hosting this event. It's wonderful to be here. As Andy said, my name is Nina Emery, and I'm an assistant professor at Brown University. I work on lots of things, but one of my main interests is the intersection between philosophy and physics. And in particular, I'm really interested in what our best scientific theories, what our best theories of physics can tell us about some of the really big, old, traditional problems in philosophy. And that's the kind of thing that I'm going to be talking about today. So, it wouldn't be a philosophy talk if I didn't have at least one really difficult, really abstract, totally out there thought experiment. Okay, so I'm just going to start right off with one. And since it's first thing in the morning, I thought maybe the thought experiment would involve coffee. Okay, so here it is. Crazy thought experiment. You've got a cup of coffee. Okay, you set it down. It's first thing in the morning, 10 a.m. Someone comes along. We're going to call him Damien, just so he has a name. Damien comes along, and he steals your coffee. Okay. That's the case. That's the thought experiment. Now, here's a question to ask yourself about that thought experiment. Okay. Is Damien morally responsible for what he did? Or maybe an easier way to put that, an easier way to get a grip on it is, did Damien do something wrong? Does it, do you have this immediate response to the case, do you think Damien did something wrong? 
A natural thing for you to say would be, well, you haven't told me enough about the case yet to decide whether or not Damien did something wrong when he stole your coffee at 10 a.m. Right? There are ways for me to fill in the details of the case so that it seems like he didn't do anything wrong. Like if I told you that Damien was sleepwalking or that Damien was under the influence of some hallucinogen that a third party had put in his tea this morning or if I told you that there was an evil neuroscientist that was fiddling with his brain, controlling his brain by remote control, forcing him to reach out, grab your coffee, and run. Right? So I'm just going to stipulate that we do not fill in the details of the case in any of those ways. Okay. The case is supposed to be one in which it's very natural to say that Damien did something wrong. It's supposed to be a paradigm case in which we are willing to assign moral responsibility to Damien for what he did. We're willing to say, he did something wrong when he stole, my cup of, when he stole your cup of coffee. Okay. I submit that all of us assume that we can fill in the details of the case this way. All of us assume that at least sometimes people act in such a way that we can hold them morally responsible for whatever they do. That is one of the basic assumptions of how we treat each other. It underwrites a lot of how, a lot of the attitudes that we assume in response to other people when we get angry at them or frustrated with them. It underwrites a lot of the policies we enact at sort of the governmental level in terms of punishments that we assign for various sorts of crimes. So I submit that we all assume that at least sometimes we can, people act in such a way that we can assign moral responsibility to them for what they did, and that if it turns out that that wasn't true, that assumption is false, that we ought to act quite differently. We ought to adopt different attitudes towards people in certain situations. We shouldn't be so mad or frustrated, and we should also sort of redesign things at the policy level in terms of how we punish people for doing things that we would naturally describe as wrong. What I'm going to talk about today is the fact that it looks like our best theories of physics make trouble for that assumption, the assumption that at least sometimes people act in such a way that we can hold them morally responsible for what they do. In particular, I'm going to talk about two problems that our best theories of physics seem to raise for that assumption. And then at the end of the talk, I'm going to say something about how those problems interact. Okay. I'm going to move, both of the problems that I'm going to talk about are sort of classic problems in philosophy. I'm going to move really quickly through them. Okay. So these are the sorts of problems that we would easily spend, we could easily spend a week or more on if I was teaching them in class. But I just want to give you guys sort of a taste of the way in which physics can make problems for the assumption that we're starting with. OK, so a teeny little bit of setup before we get to the problems. One, the first piece of setup, we're going to be assuming that the complete state of the world at any given time is determined by the fundamental entities that exist and the fundamental properties that those entities instantiate. What are the fundamental entities that exist and what are the fundamental properties that they instantiate? It's a great question. The answer is, we're not entirely sure. They're whatever, physics, they're whatever physicists tell us they are. Okay? So a natural thing to think is that they're the fundamental particles that show up in the standard model, things like quarks and photons, maybe the Higgs boson too. Right? The properties that they instantiate are things like occupying a certain point in space, Maybe things like spin, electromagnetic charge. Okay. But maybe it's something wackier than that. Maybe the fundamental entities just are points in space that themselves instantiate certain kinds of properties. Maybe that's the kind of view that quantum mechanics gives us, the sort of picture of the world that quantum mechanics gives us. It's hard to say, or quantum field theory gives us. Hard to say. Anyway, the fundamental entities are whatever the physicists tell us they are. And we assume that the complete state of the world is determined by those fundamental entities and the properties they instantiate. So if you want to talk about, if you want to describe the world, let's put it this way. You could describe the world in terms of things like people and cups of coffee and you know, school buses, right? 
But if you only describe the world at that level, you'd be leaving out at least some information. In order to get all of the information, you'd have to talk about where each quark is located, right? Where each electron is located and what, what spin it has, things like that. Okay. So that's what it means to talk about the complete state of the world. A natural question to ask about the complete state of the world is, how does the complete state of the world at one time influence the complete state of the world at another time? And the laws of physics are going to tell us that. That's what the laws of physics do. They tell us, given the complete state of the world at one time, what the complete state of the world at another time will be, or what we should expect it to be. Okay. The laws of physics can be either deterministic or indeterministic. And this is the one, those are the two, I guess, um, real pieces of technical terminology we're going to rely on today. So they're near the bottom of the first page of your handout, I guess sort of two-thirds of the way down the first page of your handout if you're interested. What it means to say that the laws are deterministic is that the complete state of the world at a time, combined with the laws of nature, determines the complete state of the world at any other time. And what it means to say that the laws are indeterministic is just that they're not deterministic. Okay? It's, just, it's not the case that the complete state of the world at one time, combined with the laws of physics, determine the complete state of the world at any other time. Okay. It is currently an open question whether or not the laws are deterministic. Okay. Physicists are not sure. I'm going to say a little bit more about that at the end. But here, there is this one thing that will play a crucial role in what I'm going to say that physicists are sure about. Okay. They're sure that if the laws are indeterministic, they are wholly indeterministic. That means that the complete state of the world at any time, combined with the laws of nature, does not determine the complete state of the world at any other time. So one way that the laws could turn out to be indeterministic is that there's just one special time during the course of the history of the universe at which the complete state of the world is sort of completely unrelated to anything else that's happening during, during the course of history. So the laws are deterministic insofar as they apply to all times except just this one weird special time. Physicists are certain that the laws are not like that. They're certain that if they're indeterministic, they're wholly indeterministic. So it's never the case that given the complete state of the world at one time and the laws of nature, you can predict with certainty the complete state of the world at any other time at all. Okay? Even if the time that you're interested in is, say, the very next instant. Okay. okay. You guys will see me use those terms a little bit more as we go, and hopefully they'll become a little bit more clear. Since it's such a short talk, I need to move relatively quickly through the material. All right, so the first problem that physics raises for the assumption that people at least sometimes act in such a way that we can hold them morally responsible for what they do is the following. If it turns out that the laws are deterministic, then we could not have done anything other than whatever it is that we actually do. Okay. So, the laws are deterministic. That means that the complete state of the world at any time, combined with the laws of nature, determines the complete state of the world at any other time. More specifically, the complete state of the world, sometime during the late Jurassic period, combined with the laws of nature, determines the complete state of the world at 10 a.m. this morning. Okay. That just follows from the claim that the laws are deterministic and the definition of what it is for the laws to be deterministic. The complete state of the world during the late Jurassic period, combined with the laws of nature, determine the complete state of the world at 10 a.m. this morning. Okay. So now think about the fact that Damien stole my coffee at 10 a.m. this morning. In order for him to have refrained from stealing my coffee, right, 
either there would have had to be some difference in the complete state of the world during the late Jurassic period, or there would have had to be some difference in the laws of physics. Because the complete state of the world in the late Jurassic period, combined with the laws of physics, determined the complete state of the world at 10 a.m. this morning, which includes Damien stealing my coffee. So if Damien were to refrain from stealing my coffee, he would have either had to make it such that the state of the world during the late Jurassic period were different, or the laws of physics were different. But Damien can't do any of those things, right? He's just an ordinary guy. He can't change the way things were in the late, late Jurassic period, and he can't change the laws of physics. So it seems like Damien couldn't have done anything other than what he actually did. He couldn't have refrained from stealing my coffee. But then how can we say that Damien did something wrong? How can we assign moral responsibility to him for his act? After all, he couldn't have done anything else. OK, like I said, a classic argument in philosophy, the kind of argument we could spend quite a bit of time talking about. I just want to give you a taste of that argument. I'm going to move on to the second problem, but we can talk a bunch more about it in the Q&A, if you guys have questions about that. That's the first, the first problem that physics, the laws of physics raise, is for the assumption that people at least sometimes are morally responsible for what they do. If the laws are deterministic, then we could not have done anything other than what we actually did. It seems like we shouldn't assign people moral responsibility for things that they, such that they couldn't have done anything else. The second problem is that if instead the laws are indeterministic, then it looks like what we do is just a matter of chance. Okay. So why is that? Remember I said if the laws are indeterministic, physicists tell us they're wholly indeterministic. Okay. So the complete state of the world at any time, combined with the laws of nature, doesn't determine the complete state of the world at any other time. More specifically, or it follows from that, that the complete state of the world at, say, 9.59 and 59 seconds doesn't determine the complete state of the world at 10 a.m. Okay. So even given everything that's true of Damien at 9.59 and 59 seconds, okay, it still wasn't determined whether he would steal my coffee or not at 10 a.m. He, could, he might have stolen my coffee, and he might not have, given everything that was true of him the very instant before he stole it. But then it seems like, OK, he might have stolen my coffee, he might not have, given everything that was true of him just the instant before he actually stole it. So him stealing my coffee seems like it was just a matter of chance. Okay. It could have gone either way. Nothing about him determined whether or not he would steal the coffee. But then how can we say that Damien did something wrong? If what he did was just a matter of chance, then it doesn't seem like we can assign moral responsibility to him for what he did. That's the second problem that the laws of physics raise for the assumption that we can at least sometimes assign moral responsibility to people for what they do. OK, like the first problem, that's a classic argument in philosophy. We could talk about it for a week or more, and we can definitely talk about it um, in the Q&A. But I want to point out something that is very rarely observed about the way that these two problems interact. Okay. So the two problems, again, if the laws are deterministic, we couldn't have done otherwise than what we actually did. If the laws are indeterministic, then what we do is just a matter of chance. Often these two problems are presented as forming a dilemma. So either you figure out how to make sense of the fact that we can still have moral responsibility for what we do, even though we couldn't have done anything else, or you figure out how to make sense of the fact that we can have moral responsibility for what we do, even if what we do is just a matter of chance. Both of those things, either of those things would be difficult to do. So. You have a challenge ahead of you, but what the challenge is is to choose one or the other and choose how to respond to it, figure out a way to respond to it. 
It's a dilemma. Actually, I think that if you look at the laws of physics, it's worse than that. It's not that you have to figure out how to respond to one of these two problems. It's that you have to figure out how to respond to both of them. Okay. So here's why. The current state of play in physics is that we've got a whole bunch of theories that are all equally good at capturing the data that we've collected so far, or predicting the results of experiments that we can perform. According to some of those theories, the laws are deterministic, and according to others, they're indeterministic. And we can think of experiments that would tell us which of the theories is correct, but it just turns out that those experiments are always the sort of experiment that creatures like us will never be able to carry out. They involve things like creating an experimental setup that runs over the course of many light years, stuff like that. Okay. So there are experiments that would tell us which of these theories is correct. We can't perform those experiments, not just because we don't have fancy enough computers yet or something like that. There's, it seems like there's something about us that keeps us from being able to perform those experiments. Okay. Creatures like us are never going to be able to perform them. So the current state of play in physics is that both deterministic laws of physics and wholly indeterministic laws of physics are live scientific options. And it seems like given that they're both live scientific options, we need to, we can't just come up with a way of making sense of moral responsibility if it turns out that one of them is correct. Because it might turn out, in a very strong sense of might, that the other one is correct. So if you've got a way of responding to the worry about how to assign moral responsibility if the laws are deterministic, great. But it's a very real possibility that the laws of physics aren't deterministic. They're wholly indeterministic. And if it turns out that that's true, then we should not be, and you don't have a response to the second problem I discussed today, then we shouldn't be assigning moral responsibility to the people around us. We should be acting very, very differently. Okay? We shouldn't be getting angry at people when they do things that we would naturally describe as wrong, we shouldn't be sending them to prison, stuff like that. Or we need to rethink our motivations for doing things like that. Okay, so the sort of upshot to leave you all with is that not only do we have these two classic problems that physics seems to raise for a very natural assumption we make in the course of our everyday lives, but these two problems don't just form a dilemma. We need a response to both of them. So philosophers, really have their work cut out here. All right, thanks very much. So we have about 20 minutes or so for Q&A, plenty of time to delve into this a little bit more. Um, I'll go ahead and moderate questions. So the way this will work, uh, raise your hand if there's a queue, I'll start a queue. Um, and if you want to jump in with a follow-up question, then just you know, show me one finger and jump in with the follow-up. So, who's first? Yeah, so with these two dilemmas of, or the problem of the person taking your coffee, do we not consider like the thought that's going through that person's mind when, I guess, considering what, whether they morally did it or if it was just happening by chance? Um, okay, can you say a little bit more? So I thought you were going a slightly different direction than, than where you went at the end. So, <laughs> no. so there's, there's a lot to pick up on in, in that question. All right, something that people sometimes say, and tell me if this is what you've got in mind, is that it doesn't matter, the only thing that really matters is whether or not Damien intended to steal my coffee. He had good reason to steal my, he had some reason to steal my coffee. He was, you know, he'd forgotten to get himself a cup this morning and he was like, oh, it's early, coffee would be great right now. He walks right up, he waits until I'm looking the other direction, he steals my coffee, right? So all that really matters is the sort of the, the description that I've just given of his thought process. Anytime somebody goes through a thought process like that, they're fully informed about the situation, they've deliberated rationally, 
they're not under the influence of any drugs, they, um, they clearly and deliberately form an intention to act a certain way and then they act that way, then they're morally responsible for whatever they do. All you have to do is tell that little story. Is that the kind of thing, is that what you have in mind? Yeah, so the thought, as you say, his, the thought that he has that sort of encompasses that whole mental process there. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a really natural thing to say, and you're picking up on uh, a very common line of response here. The worry is, right, so that's definitely how we think about other people, is those are the situations in which we're willing to assign moral responsibility. The question is whether or not we should assign moral responsibility in those cases. So, I mean, if I told you that the evil neuroscience, now we're really going to have a, a thought experiment. Okay. It turns out that the evil neuroscientist is in the next room, and he's fiddling with the neurons in Damien's brain. Okay. Now, there's a couple different ways that he could fiddle with the neurons in Damien's brain, right? He could just fiddle with the neurons that make Damien move his hand and grab my coffee and walk away. In that case, you don't have the whole mental process that we were just talking about that seems to us to sort of track moral responsibility. But there's another way that the neuroscientist could mess with Damien's brain, right? He could cause Damien to desire some coffee, to believe that the, best, the easiest way to get some coffee would be to just steal mine, to form the intention to steal the coffee, right? He could do, the neuroscientist can do all that stuff just by jiggling the neurons around. This is my extent of neuroscience right here. Um, right, it's natural, it seems natural to me, I don't know what you think about it, but it seems natural to me that in the case I just described, Damien's not morally responsible for stealing my coffee, even though he had that sort of robust thought process that's, that seems in normal cases to track our assignment of moral responsibility. And then the worry is, at least about the deterministic case, the worry is that it's just like that, right? So yeah, Damien's having this whole robust thought process of forming an in, of having certain beliefs and desires and forming an intention and acting in accordance with that intention. But the root cause of all of that, well, talking about causes is going to get loaded, but that whole mental process that he goes through, it's determined or constrained in some important way by all of these external factors that aren't under his control at all. So it's not his fault that he had that whole mental process. So we shouldn't assign moral responsibility. Does that help? Yeah. You can, so like I said, the thing that you just brought up is, is like a classic line of response. And um, so you can definitely push it farther. And um, it'll probably mean you need to resist the way that I was responding to the neuroscientist thought experiment. But you can definitely, there's a lot of fruitful philosophy to be done kind of along that, that path. Thank you. Jen? Did you follow up? Did you, did you have another follow-up? No. no. Okay, so um, I, think I, I think I have an idea of the, the lines of follow-up that might be mm -hmm. pursuing. It's a way of trying to cut the discussions of moral responsibility off from the discussions of physics and determinism. Um, and I'm sort of drawn to that. But, but sort of setting it aside, I'm thinking about the conclusion of the argument and the mm -hmm. upshot of the argument. Because mm -hmm. it seems like there's a, I don't know if it's proper to call this a paradox, but it's a little paradoxical, right, to say, well, shouldn't we stop holding people morally responsible as though we're responsible for whether we call people uh -huh. responsible? Um, that I don't, you know, so if the upshot of the argument is sort of, yeah, whether determinism or indeterminism is true, we're, we're not responsible for what we do, so <coughs> similarly we're not responsible for whether we do or don't mm -hmm. hold. So if it's supposed to have bite, then it seems like it bites itself in a way. Hmm. And the other way of thinking about it is, well, it, no, it, if, the, if the question whether we should hold people responsible is supposed to be a, a significant one, it's undermined by the argument itself. So maybe that's a reason to think that actually it's not that compelling. It doesn't have that much bite because, <laughs> yeah. So I, that seems to me somehow paradoxical. I don't know what you'd say. Yeah, it, this is, it's a really good question. Um, 
So there's going to be questions about how determinism interacts with fatalism. And I think that this is, that your question is going to, is going to connect to that debate. I mean, hmm. I'm trying to think of a clear, the most clear way to put things. I mean, it doesn't seem like, so if, so here's a analogous thing that I might say. People debate about whether or not, you know, they should have a cup of coffee in the morning. This is a serious, serious question, right? Like if I hadn't had a cup of coffee this morning, it would be very difficult for me to, to do it. I have this terrible headache right now. Right? Serious question, should I have a cup of coffee or not this morning? I mean, you might say, well, look, if, you, if determinism is true, then either you're going to have a cup of coffee or not. So why bother debating it? Right? So then it seems like we shouldn't sort of worry about anything. We shouldn't debate about what we should do in any sense of what we should do, not just about whether or not we should assign moral responsibility. So all of that is just to say that um, I think that if the little argument that you gave that we shouldn't worry about whether or not to assign moral responsibility because either we're going to or we're not, maybe that's, a, maybe that's an unfair reconstruction of your argument. Well, it's not quite. I mean, I, uh -huh. I agree. There's a <coughs> sort of really facile version of this, which is like, oh, this makes my brain hurt, and I don't want to think anymore about it. And yeah. That's my next thoughts, right? <laughs> and, then, and then there's a, like, sort of Strassen version of it, which is to say the concept of moral responsibility isn't really engaging down here at the level of physics and determinism. It's, mm -hmm. it's operating in a different realm. And so it's that line that I, I think see. is more supported, or I'm trying to mm -hmm. draw toward by saying, I, I don't know how, we need to make sense of what the conclusion conclusion of the argument is, mm -hmm. if we, so if the conclusion of the argument is our practices of ascribing moral responsibility are irrational, then I think we're, I think that's fine, but if the, if the conclusion is then therefore we should do something different, mm -hmm. then I think we start to have that problem, that, mm -hmm. that circle of, well that assumes that we're res not just the question of Practically speaking, do I debate about what to do about anything? But in particular, that one. Huh. I may be, I may be wrong, but. No, it's not. It's not at all obvious uh, to me which which way to go here. But hmm. so the the thought is that there's something distinctive about deliberating about whether or not we should assign moral responsibility if determinism is true. No. If we've already, so there's something distinctively uh, irrational about debating about, say, how we, should, like, how we should treat other people if we've already concluded that assignments of mor assigning moral responsibility to other people is irrational. Like this, is a care this is one of the things for which we would assign responsibility, is the ascription of responsibility. Mm -hmm. and, and that seems like it somehow eats up, fills huh. up. I think yeah. I have a way to, Good. But can I jump in with a quick follow-up? I think Jen's worry is, we've got these arguments that seem to undermine moral responsibility. And if that leads us to a conclusion that we should be behaving differently, mm -hmm. if your should talk mm -hmm. presupposes moral responsibility, uh -huh. then that, is that sort of what, it, the should talk presupposes moral responsibility. So we have an argument that mm -hmm. no one's morally responsible, mm -hmm. so we should behave in these ways. If, if the should talk that you use there rationally commits you mm -hmm. to moral responsibility, Mm -hmm. There'd be the word. I think that's the. And I think the same thing would go if what we were wanting to use is some non-moral concept of like of rational responsibility or cognitive epistemic responsibility. I think the same, the the whole dilemma would go forward in the same way, and so you would end up with the same kind of problem that you may be presupposing mm -hmm. that. Yes, thank you. Huh. It's interesting. I'm not entirely sure what to say. I mean, does it? Do you think that it helps at all if? 
You don't make a grand pronouncement like, we should not assign moral responsibility. But every time, you know, every time uh, Jason knocks over Sam's coffee and Sam gets annoyed at him, you're, you say, uh, that's a weird way to act. Like, why are you acting that way? Do you see what I mean? So you're, I'm trying to avoid making claim about what we should do, yeah. such that I'm making use of the notion of moral responsibility while still hanging on to the idea that, um, that yeah, when Sam gets mad at Jason, it's hard because I want to say he's doing something wrong. <laughs> um, and that's, yeah, that's what we're trying to avoid, yeah. yeah. So I'll stop. Jamie, are you going to say something? Yeah, well, it's, it's along the same lines, and I don't know how much I want to have the Q&A be about this particular problem, but um, I was thinking about coming at it in a different way, that um, there's a little more to be said about responsibility in relation mm -hmm. to these problems, that the reason why we don't want to hold uh, Damien responsible if uh, determinism is true, if, if the laws are deterministic, is his lack of control, right? He couldn't have done otherwise. It's, that's that's what's in the hand up, and that, that seems intuitively right. He couldn't have done otherwise well. Um, unless we want to go over Frankfurt, but let's set let's right. that aside. Um, I'm a little less clear on how he's not responsible if the laws are indeterministic, but it seems like something similar. If, if we're going to claim that it's just random chance, then that implies that it's not up to Damien, right? Mm -hmm. It's up to chance. And so again, he doesn't have control. So the common denominator is the lack of control. Mm -hmm. If indeterministic laws and deterministic laws both result in a lack of control over voluntary action, or what we call voluntary action, then that would seem to apply to our um, holding people responsible, our becoming annoyed, mm -hmm. and so on, right? We lose all control of that. So it would be something like, in, in the case of back tips over the coffee, I get annoyed. Um, if I do that because, if, if I get annoyed because I'm um, mistakenly ascribing control to the person who tipped it over, well, then I'm making a mistake. Mm -hmm. all right, that, that seems to be the description. Mm -hmm. So this is just a friendly suggestion? For me, yes. Yeah, so just say you're making a, a mistake as opposed to saying you're doing something wrong or something you shouldn't do, mm -hmm. and maybe that can avoid Jen, Jen's worries. Right. In, in yeah. So far as, as, as shoulds, um, in both this notion of moral responsibility, yeah. it presupposes some sort of control. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, and this is not uh, adding very much to what you're saying as opposed to just kind of restating it. But, but uh, yeah, I was I was thinking maybe you could say something like, oh, that just doesn't make any sense. So. You have this, Sam has this attitude, that attitude makes no sense to me. I'm not making any further claim that he shouldn't have the attitude, uh, certainly not in a moral sense of should, but it's just sort of like, what? That's weird. Why are you doing that? Um, I don't know if that helps much. No, I, do, I do think that something like that, now I'm not sure, I think that you might be able to push it back a little bit so uh -huh. that when we're talking about descriptions of what does and doesn't make sense, rather than talking about yeah. that responsibility, but but there are a whole host of other interesting questions to pursue here. Right. I mean, you can imagine Sam saying, who cares if it doesn't make sense? And it, it's, yeah, I mean, or uh, you could see him putting pressure on me to say, okay, so it doesn't make sense, who cares? Um, and then it seems like eventually I'm gonna have to say something like, but yeah, you should stop. So yeah, you should try to make sense. It's good, all of us should try to make sense. So there's two kinds of reasons we might give up on a practice of moral responsibility mm -hmm. after hearing these arguments. We might give up on it because we decide it's unfair. Mm -hmm. It's unfair to Damien to, to blame him when he either acted deterministically or because or by chance. Or we might decide that it's inefficacious, that mm -hmm. if we start blaming people, we're just not going to get anywhere because they're going to do whatever they're going to do, <laughs> whether or not we blame them or not, either by chance or by deterministic <coughs> reasoning. And do you feel that both of those reasons are equally um, connected to your kind of argument? I mean, is it, or is it that your argument, I mean, that both determinism and determinism show that it's unfair to hold people morally responsible, or that we're just not going to get anywhere by doing it because whatever we do is pointless in the sense that it's just not going to have any efficacy? 
Because that ladder seems just false. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, was, I had the former in mind, so I was thinking that it's unfair to hold people morally responsible in these, in these circumstances. But why wasn't the other one also? You know, if we really take determinism seriously or indeterminism seriously, it seems as if the efficacy worry might be present too, that, you know, it ties back to the fatalism point. Right, exactly. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I have too much to say other than I think these are more sort of general worries about fatalism. Um, which are, are super philosophically interesting, but I'm not sure I have a ton to say about it, about that right now. But yeah, it's good at that distinction though between those two things that might be wrong, I think it's really helpful. Um, we should actually end there. Keith, I'll just have you follow up with Dr. Emery afterwards. Uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Emery.